Giordano. Hello, Elizabeth. This is my son, William. William, this is your Uncle Daniel. How do you do, sir? The chip off the old block, eh, Elizabeth? From the set of his shoulders, I would say that he takes after his father. People have remarked on the resemblance. Well, my boy, do you remember me? Uncle Daniel. I did once have an Uncle Daniel. I believe he went abroad. Off to make my fortune in Australia. I've made it. Now I'm back to claim my own. William. I remember. There's an old photograph in a silver frame. Mama keeps it in her dressing table. You wore a beard and held an old-fashioned stovepipe hat. You stood very straight and stiff. It was a long time ago. Yes, I imagine so, for you are obviously much, much older now. <laughs> and so are you, my boy. Now then, offer you. Your mother and I have matters of business to discuss. Yes, sir. I trust I may shortly have the pleasure of renewing our acquaintance. You can bet your boots on it. Boots? Oh, oh, yes, sir. Goodbye, Mama. Uncle Daniel. Well, Elizabeth, you're not a day older. I owe time a mounting debt, which no doubt someday I shall be asked to pay. But not today. No, not today. The fashion becomes you. Thank you. An improvement on the crinoline, all those hoops and whalebone, so constricting. Do you remember? I remember. Mrs. Gibson, what sort of offal do you call this? Steak and kidney pie. Fresh meat and fresh kidneys. And if it's not to your taste, I'm sorry. Mrs. Gibson, I pay you good wages, and all you can produce is a burnt offering that would disgrace the forecastle of a Yankee bloodboat. I'm sure I do my best, sir. Uh. But if I may say so, I've put up with nothing but carping criticism this past week, ever since Miss Gaunt left. Perhaps it would be better if I were to tender my notice. Oh, don't be such a fool and see who that is, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, and see this catches the afternoon post, will you? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. What troubles have you brought with you this time, then, eh? Who do you think I've just seen? Well, given time, no doubt you'll tell me. You're in a rare old temper these days, aren't you? I've just seen Daniel Fogarty. Fogarty? Aye, it must be all of 16 years since old man Fraser sent him packing with a flea in his ear, and there he was, dressed to kill and as large as life. What the devil does he want, do you think? I have done well, Elizabeth, very well. Were Albert alive, I could match him a gold piece for every penny he could muster. I trust you are not suggesting I was ever for sale to the highest bidder. Of course not. And if you were, even I could not afford you. It would seem your absence in the colonies has not only brought you wealth, but taught you gallantry as well. Has that gallantry yet extended to paying a call upon your wife? Well, I plan to see her shortly. Poor Emma, I dealt hardly with her. She deserved better than you, Daniel Fogarty. Perhaps we deserved each other. There was little love lost between us. In fact, were it not that I have some business to conclude, I doubt I would trouble to impose myself upon her. If your business is in the disposal of her property, I suggest you hasten to her bedside. A certain Mr. Macaulay has already made a bid for her Fraser holdings. Ah, yes, Macaulay. You know him? Yes, I know Mr. Macaulay. I know him extremely well. That man has been a thorn in our side ever since his arrival. He seems to have money to burn. Indeed he has. And half of it is mine. Yours? Tom McCauley is my partner. What? I sent him on ahead as a nominee to buy Emma's shares. What, um, what is her holding? About 30%? Exactly 30%, as you well know. Just what is your interest? McCauley's parents were transported felons. That would be about 1820. And when Tom was of age, he was given a grant of land, a currency lads, they call them. Now, when I first met him, he had land, but no stock. I had capital, but no experience. We put the two together, and now we own a cattle station the size of Wales. More sheep than a man can count, a gold mine, and money in many other enterprises. Well, I thought that might impress you. You would do better to impress your partner before he skins you like a cat. Tom McCauley, never. 
You may have learned a great deal about grazing hordes of smelly sheep and digging gold out of the ground, but you always had a poor head for business, Daniel. I have learned a lot from Tom McCauley. I tell you, that man is lining his own pockets. He wouldn't, not Tom. He's a scoundrel to his fingertips. Well, I'll have a word with him. It was very kind of you to invite me to dinner, James. <laughs> I can recommend the food. Far superior to anything I've had at home recently. <sighs> suffered from a series of kooks who can't cook an housekeeper who can't keep house. Well, you must advertise and carefully interview each applicant. I'm oh. sure you wouldn't tolerate an inefficient sea captain. I haven't the time to attend to such detail. I, I need someone of proven competence. A helpmate. Are you comfortable the way you are? Yes, thank you, James. I'm quite comfortable. No, no I mean uh, in your present position. Oh, uh, yes. Sir Charles is a most considerate employer, and the children are little angels and never a cross word. I've got my own private sitting room, and I'm waited on hand and foot. Mm. <clears throat> well, now I can recommend the soup. I think we should start with that. Yes, uh, the oxtail. Oxtail soup, sir? I'm content to be guided by you. Right. Oh, I see they have some venison pasty. Do you like venison, Letty? Oh, yes, indeed. Sir Charles often has a whole haunch of venison. Ah, I see. We'll have the steak and kidney pie. Uh, good, and uh, your best burgundy, the 75, I 75. Mm. Very good, sir. How's Charlotte? Oh, she's very well. Yes, she's uh, staying with her Aunt Mary, you know. Uh, she misses you. Yes, I miss her, too. Mm. What she needs is the affection of her. Constant companion, like yourself. James, affection is not something that can be bought and paid for. Oh, I know, I know that. That's why I, um, Excuse me, sir. I... Uh, yes, um... Uh, uh, damn it. See you, that is. Hello, Tom. <laughs> Daniel! <laughs> well, it's good to see you. And you. Well. Yeah. Bit different to the old homestead, eh? It is. Well, sit down. You'll take a bite? No, thank you, Tom. Here. Clear this mess away and fetch us a bottle of your best red. Well, fancy you living here. This used to be quite an exclusive hotel. Well, the only thing exclusive in this world is money. I thought I taught you that. Oh, well, you taught me many things. And one of them was that partners should trust one another. Go on. How much does he pay you? A hundred pounds a year. Good God, the man must be made of money. Well, I see no alternative but to outbid him. I'm afraid that's quite out of the question. Oh, Letty, you haven't yet heard my offer. Now, I see no other course but to ask you to be my wife. What? As I cannot compete with Sir Charles on his terms, I needs must compete on mine. Oh, James. Only you could turn a romantic proposal of marriage into a business proposition. I'm sure the words must have stuck in your throat like a fishbone. Ah, well. If that's your answer, nothing more to be said. Oh, dear James. It was the loveliest proposal imaginable. You accept? Could I possibly refuse? Oh. Now, from the short time I've been in Liverpool, I've come to realize that you're not the best liked of men. Well, who the devil needs to be liked? You seem to have gone out of your way to create enemies. Listen, I don't give a damn what this toffee-nosed bunch think. We've got money. And they jump when we say jump, and that suits me fine. Have you seen your wife yet? Not yet. I called on her the other day. How was she? We had a real nice talk. But it didn't get anywhere. She wouldn't sell. 
So I went back there this morning. Well, what happened? They wouldn't let me see her. She's dying. as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear sister Emma, we therefore commit her body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all forevermore. Amen. She left me everything. She refused to sell to Macaulay. I don't understand it. She loved you, Daniel. Those two will bear watching. Well, you know, Fogarty gets everything. Did you hear? And after the way he treated poor Emma. Ah, there's no accounting for folly. Emma's shares would seem to make me a partner. You are merely a shareholder, Daniel. For the time being. What of the boy? He'll come into praises. He shows quite a talent for engineering. Mama. He takes after us. By the by, I have it in mind to marry again, Robert. Oh, yes. I, uh, I stand in need of a best man. I was wondering if, um, to if who? you, you'd uh, oblige. Marry? Oh, really, James? So, Macaulay and Fogarty are partners. Yes. Now, those two could press us hard. And I think of a mind to two. But Elizabeth's in the greatest danger. Now, Fogarty owns 30% of phrases. Macaulay, a hundred thousand pounds worth of debentures. Well, I don't see what Elizabeth can do to alter that. I can fight, Robert. But how? And with what? It would seem that the pair of them have the Midas touch. It takes more than money to run a shipping business. James? Are you suggesting we band together? Ah, just that. Oh, no. One partnership's quite enough. That lost me my house. I dread to think what another one would cost me. Look, Robert, you stand with us and you'll acquire another house. Get further amiss with Fogarty and Macaulay and you'll probably lose the shop as well. Possibly. Now, look, we need to separate those two. Get them to fight each other instead of us. Break up that partnership. But how? Well, young Elizabeth once had a partiality for young Daniel. She could always marry him. Well, it'll be a good business move. James, you really are beyond the pale. No, wait, Elizabeth, wait. James is right. You could twist dear Daniel round your little finger. Oh, so it's dear Daniel now, is it? Well, you did once show him favour, Elizabeth. Young William is living testimony to that. If you married Fogarty, he'd be family. I think it's a very good idea, James. Can we please be serious? Now, look, what are their ambitions? Fogarty left England a failure. Now wants to be acclaimed a success. Macaulay wants to cut a cut a figure as a mm, country gentleman. Now on his own, Fogarty's got the brains of a hen, and Macaulay, well, he's a fish out of water. Don't uh, underrate Daniel Fogarty, James. He's learned to profit from his past mistakes. Uh, Elizabeth might be right there. And if she is, what do we do? Well, I think I have just the answer. What do you imagine you were doing? It's a most unladylike greeting. As you see, familiarizing myself with the company's affairs. You would do well to remember that I am the majority shareholder and this company is mine. Until our son comes of age. Until my son comes of age. But until that time, I am afraid you are saddled with me. Yes. You and that scoundrel Macaulay. Yes, Macaulay. I've been looking into his affairs. 
You were a fool, Elizabeth. Then what on earth persuaded you to put yourself in his debt to the tune of a hundred thousand pounds? Necessity. Well, didn't you realise that he could foreclose at any time of his choosing? Of tuning? course. But I'm not quite the fool you take me for. I have spent no more than 40,000, and if pressed, I can raise that against the shipyards. You seem to be in an uncommon hurry to mortgage yourself to the hilt. Very well, I'll make out a draft for 40,000. It is as much in my interest as yours. After all, I am a partner. You are not. A junior partner, a very junior partner. No, I simply exchange one debtor for another. In any event, he may not be willing to sell back his debentures. I can't force him. Then convince him it's for his own good. Better the devil you know. You have but one choice, Elizabeth, me or Macaulay. Well, think about it. You don't have to use it unless Macaulay attempts to call in the debt. And you may have your desk. I was only borrowing it. Well, do you want to rid yourself of Macaulay? Well, I must admit, I would prefer to have you to myself. You've changed, Daniel. Never at a loss for words. I remember a time when the very presence of a member of the fairer sex would cleave your tongue to the roof of your mouth. You still have that effect. If I were to use this, I don't know how I could repay you. Well, you could make a start by having dinner with me. When I'd said you'd changed, I didn't mean for the better. I should like to have dinner with you, Daniel. But I do think first we ought to decide how to dispose of Macaulay, not just for my sake, but for yours as well. Blow hot, blow cold, you never change. Look, Tom Macaulay and I have been partners for years. I'd need good reason to break that up. James has one. Oh, James, he hasn't changed. As I remember, every time a pot boiled, he was always there, hard at work, fanning the flames. He has evidence. Of what? Ask him. He'll part with it at a price. Oh, of that, I am sure. Very well, I'll broach the subject. I have to see him about the wedding. Oh, this fuss, and in half an hour, it's all over and done with. James, you really are quite impossible. You seem to imagine a wedding to have no more ceremonial than signing a seaman aboard one of your confounded ships. There are arrangements to be made. The only arrangements that concern me are between Letty and the past. Oh, I've never heard such nonsense. No, neither have I. Now, come to the point. I mean, you haven't really come here to gossip about wedding arrangements. I'm only taking a sisterly interest. Oh, I know. You want me to have some grand affair, 200 people gawping at us? Well, let me tell you this. It's going to be a simple wedding. Now, you might be invited. I don't know yet. Now, what really brought you here, eh? Daniel needs your help to rid himself of Macaulay. Mm. He has already offered to pay off the balance of my debt to him. Mm. In exchange for what? It is purely a business arrangement. Mm. Now then, last night you said you had evidence of a sort. I have. Well, what is it? Look, if your Daniel is as sharp as you say he is, bring him round to see me, will you? James, I wish you would stop calling him my Daniel. Just tell me what evidence you have against Macaulay. Oh, enough to hang him. But surely the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. The world's not round like a penny, Master Samuel. It's round like an orange. Now, what's the shortest distance round that orange? Curve. Exactly. Now, you do well to remember that if you ever hope to command your own ship. Father would never permit that. I'm expected to follow in his footsteps. Robert O'Needen and son. Well, I only wish I'd had your opportunities. I'd have been somebody. <laughs> but you are. You're a ship captain. I was one of the lucky ones, thanks to Mrs. O'Needen that was. She taught me. She had the patience of a saint, that one. <laughs> I remember she set me just such a problem. Make me a flat map of an orange, she said. <laughs> it took me weeks. Now, you have the advantage of an education, so you try your hand at it. Shouldn't occupy a bright young fellow like you more than an hour, too. And don't eat the orange before you finish. Mine ended out like a shriveled up grape. <laughs> I'll try, sir. You do that. And remember, there's more to handling a ship than scampering up and down the rigging. And don't despise figures, because figures is basic. Mr. Fogarty, sir. Yeah. 
Well, James? My. We are a dandy. He'll never compete with Albert, you know. Still the same old James, always seeking the advantage, with the same vile taste in cigars. Try one of these. The tobacco's grown on one of my South African estates. Ah. Hmm. I'd sell out if I was you. No profit to be made in these. I can well afford the indulgence. <laughs> Only a fool runs a business at a loss. You haven't changed, have you, Daniel? All right, let's uh, get down to business. Certainly. Now, I've been given to understand that you claim to have some kind of evidence that could be used against my partner, Mr. Macaulay. Been chatting to Elizabeth, have you? No hope there, you know. She has a will of her own. Have you or haven't you? Evidence? So oh, I. Enough to hang him. Was it documented? Oh, it carries conviction. Very well. What is your price? You do realize that in any partnership, the law holds that both partners are equally liable. Well, I bear no responsibility for Macaulay's private transaction. Oh, but you do. You're a fool, Daniel. You should have limited your liability. But in the Australian outback. Well, you're in England now, subject to English law. I am as yet no wiser as to the offence my partner is alleged to have committed. Mm. Coffin ships. Coffin ships? Aye. Over-insuring them, sending them out and sinking them. But I'd have nothing to do with it. There's a lot of widows and orphans thirsting for Macaulay's blood. You know me better than that. Oh, yes, I believe you. But a judge might not be quite so understanding. Now, what do you propose to do with this evidence? Well, it could prove a very useful lever in the right hands. A partner can be quite an embarrassment if you have to share in everything that he does. How much? I'll take £10,000, oh, and the management of the Robert and Eaton shares. Five, and no more. I've learned a thing or two. Very well. Five thousand. There's a statement signed by Abel Seaman Kerr and witnessed. Anything else? Yes, yeah, some advice, son. Your partner's a rogue. He'll hang. Get rid of him. Buy him out if necessary. I couldn't afford it. Well, better still persuade him to buy you out. He's avaricious. He'll buy. Dealing with you and Eden is like dealing with a boa constrictor. Can I keep this? Oh, of course. It's only a copy. My heart quite goes out to poor Letty. I trust that James will have the courtesy to send us a formal invitation. Which, under the circumstances, we shall refuse. Well, do you know such thing? Oh, come on, Sarah. It's not a week since you swore you'd never speak to James again. Well, a wedding isn't speaking. A wedding's an occasion. Besides, we are family. Women. Well, it'll be a poor do, I can tell you. If James has anything to do with it, they'll be toasting the couple in cocoa. You know, he asked me to be his best man, didn't you? Well, you accepted, I trust. No. I said I'd think about it. Robert, have you no sense of social obligation? It's our bounden duty to stand by them. Of course, you must stand as groomsmen. It would be unthinkable to permit a stranger. Besides, I wouldn't put it past James to ask Captain Baines. Cutting up pieces of paper at your age, lad. I'm trying to make a map. A map? A what? An orange. Have you taken leave of your senses? The finest education that money can buy, and you spend your time making maps of oranges. Look, the orange represents the world, Father. An orange is a saleable commodity, nothing more, nothing less. Well, Captain Baines set me a problem. I think a good dose of hard work is what you need, my lad. Of course. All you need to do is project the globe of the world onto a cylinder, unroll it, and you have a Mercator projection. Well, it's simple, really. <laughs> Don't get too caught up with the problems of the sea, dear. That's not where your future lies. 
I think a veil of Holliton lace, a gown of white satin, and four bouquets for the bridesmaids. Make a note of that, Charlotte. Four bouquets. Bridesmaids? Well, we had wanted a quiet wedding. Exactly. Now, look, in my opinion, Nobody's sister, Nobody's canvassing the whole thing... your opinion, James. It's nothing to do with you. You're just the groom. Mm, I'll foot the bill, though. Oh, don't... James, really? Now, where were we? Guests. Guests. How many do we have now? Forty-two. Forty-two? Well, who have we left out? Father, can I invite Polly Summers and Betsy Aldroyd? Well, I see no reason why not, if they're of good families. And write their parents' names down as well. Oh, right. Uh, and their relatives, and their friends, and their pets. Huh. I should need to sell a ship to pay for this lot. Isn't that typical of James? Well, it was to have been a quiet affair. Well, hasn't taken you long to get your feet under the table. No, and I intend to keep them there. Well, why not? You know, there were times in the outback when I'd have sold my soul for a bottle of this. You sold that long ago. Hello. Someone been scratching your back? Come on. Out with it. You were born a currency, lad. You can't shake it off. What are you on about? You've been lambing me down, Tom. No, on my oath I ain't. I've been straight with you, Dan boy. As straight as a dog's hind leg. Are you trying to rile me? I sent you over here to buy in for me. So I would have done, excepting your Mrs. Croats and saves me the trouble. Have you got a share? So what are you bleeding about? The Fraser debentures. Ah, now that's a different matter. Now that's sauce for the gander, Daniel. My pockets are as well lined as yours. And lending money to Robert O'Needin, who told you to do that? Told? Told? Listen, you don't tell me to do anything. What I do with my own money is none of your business. Reckon I might even buy myself a country estate. A thousand or so acres. A big house with turrets and battlements. A couple of dozen servants in my own livery. Hmm? What do you think to that, eh? Not here, Tom. I'm packing you off back to Australia. You're packing me off? <laughs> oh, that's rich, that is. Listen, I'll crow on this midden or nowhere. You'll crow on the gallows. What? You heard me. The pardon, I've been with you in many things, but not murder. You better choose your words more carefully. Coffin ships. I took a gamble. You took no gamble. You made sure they went to the bottom. Well, ships go to the bottom every day. You paid to have them scuppered. Good men lost their lives. Men I might have sailed with old mates with wives and children left behind. Ah, you're going soft, Dan. It's them toffee-nosed silver tails has got at you. Or maybe it's that golden-haired dolly mop, hmm? She been keeping you warm at nights? Oh, you hold your foul tongue or I'll stuff it down your throat. Now don't you come the heavy star with me, matey. Or we'll be breaking up some furniture, you and oh, me. Oh, no, rocks is all you'll be breaking. Not without proof, I won't. <laughs> I needn't give you this. Aye. What's his price? I'll set the price. Ah, oh, no, you won't. We're partners. We sink or swim together in this. Well, I'll take my chances. But you'll spend the rest of your days tossing cannonballs around. You mean it? I mean it. All right, then. What's your price? We'll end the partnership. I'll buy you out. You ain't got that kind of money. I've got a strong card, though. Of course, you could always buy me out. I don't care which way. How much? A million. It's worth more than that, and you know it. Very well for the Australian interests only. But I want the Fraser debentures and everything else you've acquired over here. You're driving too hard a bargain, Daniel. I'm not bargaining, Tom. I'm telling. You're bluffing. <laughs> I know you too well. You're soft. You'd never turn me in. Fetch a constable. I wish to lay an information. By the holy sailors. You mean it. Goodbye, Tom. I reckon I taught you too well.
We had planned a quiet wedding. I know that's James's wish. If James had his way, you'd find yourself being married by Captain Baines aboard one of his rowing boats. <laughs> you hold out for the best that money can buy. But I don't want the best. Just leave everything to us. I think the waist could be a little tight. Oh, no, I can hardly breathe. As it is, I shall swoon. Brides are expected to swoon on their <gasps> wedding day. And we shall come well supplied with smelling salts. Oh, it's James that will need those when he realises the expense. I trust Robert can be relied upon to drag him to the church on time. You have persuaded him. Robert has unavoidable business commitments abroad. Oh? Uh, yes, he's taking ship for New York. As you know, Robert has always had an eye to the future. And having heard so much about this new American system of departmental shopping, he's decided to go and have a look for himself. He could go after the wedding. Oh, my thoughts precisely. But you know what a determined man Robert is. And once he's made up his mind to something, nothing will sway him. In other words, James is still out of favour. Is he travelling by Fraser Steamer? Of course not. He's travelling with Captain Baines aboard one of our own ships, the Orpheus. That will be a treat for Captain Baines. Tighter! Oh! <sighs> Do take care of yourself, dearest. Oh, you need have no fear on that score, my dear. When occasion calls, I can rough it with the best of them. Well, I've packed your heavy woolen underwear uh, and the goose grease for your chest mm -hmm. and a mustard plaster, lest you should take a chill. You know how susceptible you are to inclement weather. Nonsense. Oh, Robert, when you and I sailed to the Isle of Man, you suffered abominably from mal de mer. A minor indisposition. I hadn't time to find my sea legs. In any event, I'm prepared to suffer in the cause of business. Well, this ship will roll like a pig. She's round in the bilge. Why didn't you travel by steamer, Father? Because your father is a director of the Oneidin line. Correct. Time to go ashore. The casting off in a couple of minutes. You come with me, young fellow, my lad. We'll leave these two good people to say their farewells alone. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, son. Goodbye. Wrap up well. And don't venture on deck without your scarf. Keys. Well, Master Samuel, did you map the orange? I solved that problem, Mr. Baines. Good lad. But now I have another. I've got to run away to sea. I'll spend the rest of my days behind a counter. Well, that's up to you. I only wish it were. And Mr. James' father didn't want him to go to sea, neither. Times have changed, Mr. Baines. You have a hand ashore. Goodbye, Captain Baines. Bye, Mum. There we go. Have a good voyage, Captain. Why, thank you, lad. Goodbye, Father. So. Well, Captain Baines, I think we can put to sea now. Why, thank you, Mr. Robert. Away, gangway. Raise ship! And by the break of Tarsal! Good cigars. I really do relish the occasional cigar. Yes, well, uh, I only brought one box to last the whole voyage. It'll see us through. Accommodation satisfactory? Oh, much as I expected, yes. Well, this ship was built to carry steerage passengers out and timber home. Now it's cargo both ways. But most folks now, of course, travel by steamer. Still, I expect you have your reasons, sir. Several. Escape from the turmoil of commerce is one. Ah, shopkeeping. I regard this voyage, Captain Baines, as a quiet interlude between business commitments. 
A man needs to relax once in a while, you know. Captain Baines, you know the city of New York very well, I understand. Like the back of my hands, sir? Yes, it's a lively place, isn't it? Well, there's life of plenty. There's no denying that. Yes. <laughs> Places of entertainment, I don't doubt. Well, it depends what you have in mind. I mean, there's theaters, dance halls, free and easy. Uh, no, 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 no. What I had in mind was a was a discreet, quiet restaurant where a where a man like myself could uh, relax over a good dinner, a bottle of wine, and um... I know just the place, sir. Uh, nothing untoward, you understand? Oh no, 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 no. Let me refill your glass. Now. Pity I should be away when Captain O'Neill gets married. I'd like to see that. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate, and so on and so on. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We shan't bother with the responses again. Now, are you sure that everything's perfectly clear? Perfectly clear the first time. Practice makes perfect, Mr. Anedin. Uh, would you care for a glass of sherry wine, Mr. Prescott? Oh, oh yes. Thank Why you. don't you play something for us? Of course, Mama. Mr. Fogarty, sir. Ah, thank you. I trust I'm not intruding. My wedding gift. Robert's voting rights. And a draft for 5,000. I'm a man of my word. Better add you to the guest list, then, eh? Everybody else seems to be coming. Have a glass of wine. Good evening, Elizabeth. Good evening, Daniel. William plays very well. Yes, he inherits that talent from me. Well, now that I have settled with Macaulay, I think it's time to call in my remaining debt. Oh? Your promise to have dinner together. Oh, I should be delighted. Who shall we ask? And why not invite our son? My son? We shall do no such thing, and please keep your voice down. I have every right. You have no rights other than a quarterly rendering of the company's accounts. Confound the fool. I must leave immediately. Oh, well, what is it? Well, it's from the master of the Falcon. He's running aground, just leaving Port Marrick. Uh, she's in danger of becoming a total wreck. Port Marrick, North Wales. The very devil of a place to get into, as I remember. Yeah, well, things haven't improved at all. I'll take the Charlotte Road. You go through the Menai Strait? Well, I have a contract to meet. Got to get there on time. But you will be back. Hmm? The wedding. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But you've only got seven days. Look, 36 hours out, 36 hours home. I'll have time to spare, eh? That's her. Right, stand by to drop the anchor and lower the boat. Thong on Nidin and James on Nidin are aboard. Hey, Vinima. Those in all in Hatang Horty. Captain Llewellyn? Mr. Oneidin. Sorry, business, sir. Sorry, business. We was rounding the point when that devil's wind shifted and caught us aback. Yes, well, I'll read your report later. What's the extent of the damage then, eh? She sprung a little forward, but nothing to speak of. Uh -huh. We've put a stern anchor on, but she is wedged fast by the bows. You've lightened the ship? Between tides, we have done all that is humanly possible. Not so far, you haven't. She's still stuck, isn't she? Now I've got a contract to meet. I want you to transfer every article of cargo onto the Charlotte Roads, and you and your crew can sail on to Bremen. Thank you, sir. Oh, you can thank your lucky stars that I have pressing engagements in Liverpool. I've nobody else to sail her. What about my ship? Oh, don't worry. 
I'll catch her off myself. And sail her home. Barodi, show me the cargo of our Charlotte Rhodes. Right handy. Excuse me, sir. Yes. You have an empty ship. And if you are going back to Liverpool, there is something you ought to know. Well, I hope and pray he's not delayed. I mean, if the weather should take a turn for the worse. With James to contend with, it wouldn't dare. <sighs> well, I don't know what I should do. The reception, all those guests. <laughs> I'll never forget Robert marching down the aisle. His boots squeaked so dreadfully. <laughs> <laughs> Albert and I, you know, eloped to Gretna Green. There was such a to-do. Well, I should think so. After all, you were promised to Daniel. I wasn't. No vows were exchanged. But now he's returned and a success, so I wouldn't be surprised to hear wedding bells again. Well, if you do, Sarah, your hearing will be sharper than mine. He has been away five full days. Don't worry, Letty. James is never late for an appointment. Ten dollars a head. I wouldn't pay ten dollars for crimp men. I want prime semen. But I don't want him, he's damaged. You can have him back. No parson. I'll take him, he looks healthy out, fella. What do we got here? Mr. Robert. Here. Get that down. The devil's handiwork needs devil's medicine. It's a wicked town, New York, and the crimps aren't too particular. But I, I don't understand it, Captain Baines. He was crimped and shanghaied, is he? I, I just merely passed a civil word with, with a young lady. In a bar downtown? Well, yes. And what happened? Well, I... I completed my business engagements for the day. I was taking a stroll to see the sights. I got called in to a, well, a pleasant-seeming tavern. I took a glass of brandy, with water, mind you. And by chance, by purest chance, I fell into conversation with a quite presentable young woman. Who invited you to her apartment? Certainly not. First of all, she guided me to what she assured me was a select restaurant. I must confess that it wasn't exactly the sort of establishment that a man like myself would normally patronize. But um, the Americans being notoriously uncouth. Well, on the east side, they are. There was an entertainment of sorts. I must say it was in dubious taste. However, we, we dined quite comfortably. And we uh, exchanged civilities. And she took you home? Certainly not! <gasps> I merely suggested, as propriety demanded, that I be permitted to escort her home to her lodgings. <laughs> she must have looked upon you as the, as the goose that laid the golden egg. She was kind enough to invite me inside for a nightcap. It was then that someone or other struck me upon the head. Mr. O'Dean, you've been bamboozled, crimped and shanghaied. You can thank your lucky stars that we were short-handed and in the market. Otherwise, you'd have woken up aboard a Yankee blood boat bearing round the horn. I've been robbed. They've taken every penny. Well, now, it's most misfortunate, because you owe ten dollars. I what? That's the going rate. Ten dollars the crimps charge. Are you suggesting that I pay you ten dollars for the dubious privilege of being shanghaied aboard one of our own ships? Well, I can't afford it, and how else I can we explain it to Mr. James? I mean, he keeps a sharp eye on them accounts. To hell with Mr. Oh, Mr. James. He need never know. Oh, not if you pay up, he don't. I don't have ten dollars. That's all right, sir. You can sign for it. Here, put your mark there. Now, sir, are you uh, still going to go ashore? Well, of course. I still have I still have business appointments to make here. Well, you best be ashore now, because we're casting off shortly. 
don't have the money. The wretch took every penny. Well, that's all right, sir. I can let you have a couple of hundred dollars. Just sign your name again. Oh, no. Postpone wedding. Detained two days, return Thursday without fail. Isn't that typical of James? Oh, something dreadful must have happened to have made him postpone the wedding. Well, perhaps something's happened to the ship. He might be injured. <laughs> What? You dare to postpone our wedding for a cargo of stupid sheep. Oh, it was too good a bargain to miss. A bargain? Aye. Morton's fetching a fortune in Liverpool at the moment, and these were going to begging. Oh, James, how could you? Look, they'd just come down from this mountain. Now, there was no fodder for them, no ship at the quayside. James, you promised. And if I'd waited another week, somebody else would have snapped All them up. those invitations. Well, I don't know why you're so upset. Hey? We can get married in a couple of days' time. No. No. Yes, you'll see. Luke, you wanted a quiet wedding. Well, a quiet wedding you shall have. Oh, never. Never. Letty. You heard what I said. Now you go and marry one of your damn sheep. 